Welcome to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang, currently sheltering in place in San Francisco. A down day for the markets, a rough start to May. The Dow, S&P, and the Nasdaq all ending the day down at least 2.5%. This on the back of earnings from the biggest tech companies, including Amazon and Apple. Exxon Mobil posting its first quarterly loss in more than 30 years. President Trump, meantime, reviving an attack on China, threatening trade tariffs and trying to pin blame on China for the coronavirus outbreak. This is a group of experts are saying that the outbreak could go on for another two years and won't be contained until two thirds of the world's population is immune. Joining me now to break down the day that was, at least on Wall Street, Taylor Riggs has been digging into the markets for us. Why such a rough day, Taylor, when there were so many signs of hope this week. It sort of felt like a mood shift overall uh, this morning, Emily. Even as we woke up, it sort of felt like a sentiment had been really negative. As you'll remember, we were up 30% after we bottomed out on the lows on March 23rd. So there could have been some profit taking here as well as some concerns continuing about the economy. We did get news in the past few days as well overnight that Trump was considering floating around some ideas about how to punish China for the virus, for the handling of the virus, for shutting down a lot of the doctors back in December even who are really trying to warn about this. Some of those renewed um, tensions, you could say, were about canceling some of the debt. That's very far stretched, according to some of the analysts that I'm speaking to. So another option could be tariffs. Now, those tariffs are what would really pressure the SOX index. As you can see, they're off about 5% or so. As you know, that would really hit that market, given they have a lot of revenue exposure over there to China. So overall, just felt like a really big sort of mood shift today. Meantime, you know, Elon Musk making waves again. Of course, we know that he was outraged about the extent of the shelter in place order. Uh, Tesla operations still shut down at the factory in Fremont. He also tweeted this morning that he believes Tesla stock price is too high. Um, how did that influence the, the shares today? Yeah, well, the shares plunge as much as 12% immediately on that news. <laughs> I can't figure out why a CEO would say that his shares are overvalued, but nonetheless, there's a lot I think about some of the tweets that come from Elon Musk that I have yet to figure out myself. <laughs> Let me at least just give you the facts. As you'll remember, back in 2018, he had that go private tweet at $420 a share. That eventually led to a settlement of about $40 million because the SEC said that those stocks uh, that tweet, of course, had effectively moved the market. So they came to an agreement with the SEC that the tweets now need to be pre-approved by Tesla's general counsel. I was reading some research from our litigation analyst, and she said that this tweet indeed could violate that deal. But remember, Musk could argue that his opinion on Tesla stock price is based on past results, not indicative of a future market event. Still, all the less, I think investors took that negative headline, a lot of that tweeting as some pretty concerning news, and shares ended up lower by about 10% or so on the day. Meantime, I feel like we have to talk about oil. Exxon shares plunging 7%, and obviously oil has been something to watch over the last few weeks. What's happening more broadly in the energy sector? The energy sector within the sector, the energy sector of the S&P 500 had its worst day down about 6% or so. So the worst performer of all of the major sectors in the S&P 500. But you're continuing to see a divergence here between the energy stocks and actual crude prices. Crude is back up to almost $20 a barrel. It was up 4.5% or so today. But the energy stocks are not performing as well. Chevron, as you know, capping their cut up, uh, cutting their capex here by 13% as they try to conserve cash. ExxonMobil posting their first loss on their profit going back in at least 32 years. But as you can see there, crude though, having its sixth straight week of gains, now the best since April 10th. So a lot of the CapEx and the output cuts that some of the energy companies are doing are hurting their income statement, their balance sheet, but in turn, it's effectively boosting the output as we really start to pull back on that output and then boosting the prices. All right, Taylor, thanks so much for breaking it down for us. Appreciate your insight. As always here, I do want to zero in on some of these tech stocks, though, with Brent Phil, analyst at Jefferies. Brent, I want to start with Amazon also plunging almost 8% uh, today on the back of results from yesterday. Of course, Amazon saw a shrinking profit, warned about a coming uh, potential quarterly loss. Amazon has always had slim margins and has been, you know, 
certainly the most visible tech company in the pandemic, for better or for worse. What's your take on why analysts are so sour now? Hi, Emily. Uh, the stock had a huge run going into this, and the expectations were just at a point where Amazon could not deliver through. The top line was great, uh, but the bottom line was not. You know, when you hire 175,000 employees, it, it is expensive, right? And there's no tech efficiency that they can gain out of the gate. So it really revolved around the second quarter guide on the expense side, that that's really what investors honed in on. And I think, as they said, you know, they're heavily constrained. Their shipping costs uh, disclosed in their filing today was up 41% year over year, and their gross merchant value was 27. So costs are rising faster than, you know, the volume of products sold. So I think you look at that imbalance, that will clearly um, balance out o over time as they get, uh, you know, m some of the inventory back in. But we think short term, um, you know, it, it's just a combination of a big run plus the expense. And, and really, that's it. Everything else was good. Amazon, Prime, uh, you look at uh, the ad business actually accelerated while Google, Facebook, and Twitter all decelerated. So, you know, a lot of bright spots, but again, stock largely reflecting a lot of moves. We'll talk about Google and Facebook, but first, uh, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, being called to testify before a House panel on antitrust issues and concerns about how Amazon is treating third-party sellers. How much of a concern is this? I think it's a big concern, uh, but I think it, it's not really um, anything else that we haven't seen. So. We've drawn the analogy, Salesforce.com had an app ecosystem where they let partners put their, their apps on a platform. And over time, you know, Salesforce.com effectively started competing with some of those partners. And, and, and I think the same thing is happening in, in some sense in the software and in uh, Amazon's business. They're select products that so they will prove uh, that they, they will actually produce themselves and expand into new categories. And some of the partners will feel that they're, you know, being, their toes are being stepped on. And so I think ultimately this is something we've seen in, in other tech companies. Um, and, and we think that this is going to be an ongoing issue going forward. Let's talk a little bit about Google and Facebook. Obviously, you know, both of them depend on online advertising, the ad industry certainly going into a contraction period. Facebook said they saw a steep decline, but that things have been stabilizing in April. Uh, Alphabet's numbers probably weren't as bad as some thought they could be, but it's really the current quarter that we're all concerned about where we'll see a fuller impact from this pandemic. I mean, what are you, what are you expecting for the current quarter in terms of just how badly the ad industry is going to be hit and how badly that in turn hits Facebook and Google? The June quarter is going to be bad, uh, no question, right? Uh, uh, you look at, at Facebook, they said they saw an even pullback among large enterprise and small businesses. Uh, they've seen a flat year-over-year uh, -year, uh, growth rate. So, you know, things haven't gotten terrible and in a decline. You're seeing a decline at Google and, and Twitter and others. But I think ultimately June's going to be a really, really tough uh, quarter. Um, it's going to have a bigger impact to Twitter because they do more brand than direct response, and brand is really hit. So Twitter's the worst off. We think Facebook is actually the best off, and Google is somewhere in the middle if we had to kind of frame it. Uh, ultimately, I think the one thing that's binding us all together as we work from home is the Internet, right? The eyeballs are there, and uh, the old uh, CEO of AOL said this very well. Uh, we're going to see the highest usage of, of, of actual media in our life but the lowest advertising rates. And that's because advertisers are in a spin, right? They, they just, companies are not spending a lot of money on advertising as they try to figure out their business. And so it really goes back to the shape of the virus. If we can get this under control and get, get uh, more confidence built, you're going to see uh, ad dollars come back. But, you know, we, we believe Twitter will be the last one to see ad dollars come back. Uh, Facebook, to us, is the most insulated. Uh, and, and then you have you know, Google and Snap, uh, somewhere in between. So what makes you think that Facebook is in a better position than Google? Well, just the numbers right now, right? Uh, Google saw, again, in late March, a mid-teen decline. Facebook said things were flat. 
So just if you look at the pure numbers and the, the magnitude of the downfall, that's just the numbers that they've given. So if you just measure it by numbers, number one. Uh, number two, clearly Facebook's smaller uh, than Google. Uh, number three, uh, Facebook uh, has, in, in our opinion, you know, a lot of communities that are on there. A lot of people are spending money to, to be seeing direct responses really high right now. We look at uh, Instagram uh, it is doing very, very well on advertiser ROI around commerce is extremely high. So Facebook on Instagram and anyone that's been on Instagram that's bought anything knows what I'm talking about. You, you, you end up buying things you don't really feel like you need because you see a picture and you, you sell through and you click through. That ROI is so big for the advertisers we speak to that sell you know, sweatpants or uh, stay-at-home gear. Uh, so that we think ultimately, uh, you know, again, no one's immune. Uh, we think they're all at risk. We do think, again, we have confidence in a $10 earning number for Facebook. And again, a, a low 20 multiple gets you to higher levels on the stock. Uh, but no one, no one's going to be immune out of this. All right, Brent Phil of Jeffrey's Brent, always good to have your perspective here on the show. Meantime, coming up, thousands of Food Network cooking classes. Only some people are going to get them for free. We'll tell you who coming up when we speak with the CEO of Direct to Consumer at Discovery. Also coming up later in the show, how the esports company gaming giant EA is faring in a pandemic. Could gaming be the one industry that's pandemic proof? That's coming up. This is Bloomberg. Well, at-home cooking is now an essential routine, and Discovery wants to make it a joy rather than a chore. In a new partnership with Amazon, Fire TV and Fire tablet customers now have access to a massive library of Food Network kitchen, kitchen classes and recipes for free. Joining me now is the CEO of Discovery Direct-to-Consumer, Peter Farrisey. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. So tell us how the partnership is working so far, what's viewership been like, since you launched this? Well, and thank you, Emily, for having us. You know, right now, while we're all sheltering at home, we're all doing a lot of two things. We're streaming a lot of uh, television and we're all doing a lot of home cooking. And so Food Network Kitchen is sort of the perfect companion product for the time. Uh, all these great shows from the Food Network that people love so much. Uh, and then we kind of have the Peloton of cooking classes. You know, we have over 2,300 live and on-demand cooking classes tutorials, over 80,000 recipes. So it's the it's the perfect companion product. And Amazon, you know, deciding to give a, a one-year complimentary subscription to all of their Fire TV owners and all their Fire tablet owners gives us kind of instant scale, uh, which is really great during this time. So tens of millions of people around the U.S. are going to come join us, and uh, we can't wait. Now, any plans? I know you worked at Amazon for a decade, so I'm curious uh, how that uh, relationship played into this and if you have any plans to expand this to non-Amazon customers. Well, it, you know, we, we launched the product in October and it's available on iOS and Android and Roku. So it's available on all platforms today. We really, this, this partnership with Amazon is special because they're the leading company in the world for voice technology with Alexa. We have the most powerful food brand in the world with Food Network. And it's sort of the combination of those two that we think creates an amazing customer experience. Just as an example, Emily, when you're taking a cooking class with us, you can use Alexa commands, you know, and this is powerful because if, when you're making stuff in the kitchen, your hands are usually tied up in the food you're making. So there's really, there's lots of good use cases to integrate voice with the great uh, food content we have and we, and we hope make uh, lots more joy in the kitchen. This coming weekend, we're doing something pretty big. Uh, we have 10 of our most famous Food Network chefs doing live classes all weekend long. So Bobby Flay, Valerie Bertinelli, Alex Kernichelli, Michael Simon, all of your favorites doing live classes. And, you know, during this time, a lot of people want comfort food. So, you know, Bobby's got a brunch burger Saturday. We got some gnocchi on Sunday. So uh, we're really excited to see audience reaction. All right, I'm hungry already, Peter. Thanks for that uh, little taste. Uh, curious how Discovery streaming products are faring during this time of social distancing. Like, what channels and shows 
um, are seeing, you know, maybe a pickup in traffic. Um, discovery education, I might, I might imagine, would be seeing some trends that are interesting. Yeah, it's incredible to see the lift. You know, we measure pre-COVID sort of in post-COVID if there's such a window. And on the linear TV side, we're seeing huge audience increases for Food Network, HGT, uh, HGTV, TLC, Discovery Channel. Uh, people are really spending a lot more time at home. And then on the direct-to-consumer side of the business, all of our products around the world. We have a product called D-Play in Europe, Motor Trend here in the U.S., Food Network Kitchen, a product in Poland called TVN Player. You know, they're getting huge increases, both in, in free users, but also in subscribers. So there's absolutely a, a huge trend of seeing you know, 40, 50% increases in engagement and subscribers all across the board. Meantime, Discovery stocks aren't doing so well. We've seen a decline in, in about 20% over the last three months. You know, it, it, is that the impact of the pandemic and how do you expect Discovery to weather that given that this could go on for many more weeks and months? Well, I think, you know, if you take a look at most of the media companies, they, they really have uh, two major revenue streams, affiliate revenue and, and ad sales. Our affiliate revenue is, is relatively stable, but certainly on the ad sales front, you know, we're seeing uh, that impacted by the pandemic. But if you kind of do a forward look at this company, I think we all believe very strongly that we're building a business tied to these super fan verticals. You know, people love food, they love cooking, they love home, they love natural history. And there's no question, you know, as these direct-to-consumer products become bigger and bigger over time, that we feel like we have a very bright future. So I personally don't feel like the stock price actually represents, you know, the real true value of this company going forward yet. Now, I'm curious, just given that you worked at Amazon for such a long time and you were in charge of third-party sellers, you know, we've been covering Amazon's... Um, um, relationship with third-party sellers. Now Jeff Bezos is being called to testify before the House uh, over antitrust issues. We know Amazon has been making a lot more Amazon-branded products. Broadly, do you believe that third-party sellers on Amazon are getting a fair shake? You know, I, I guess I'd say this. The, uh, in my time at Amazon, I think the Amazon leadership is of extremely high integrity. I think it's a very, very well-run company. And I think at the very top of the leadership principles of Amazon is being customer obsessed. And Amazon defines customers not just as the people who buy on the website, but also their seller partners, their web partners, their advertising partners. So, you know, if my time at Amazon is any indication, I think Amazon does a really great job with all of their customer groups. All right, uh, Peter Sferisi, Discovery CEO of Direct to Consumer. Going to be tuning into those <laughs> cooking classes with all my free time this weekend. Peter, thank you Fantastic. so much for joining us. Thank you, Emily. Uh, meantime, we are getting some, thank you. Meantime, we are getting some breaking news that uh, Kim Jong-un has made his first public appearance in North Korea in 20 days, showing up at a factory there. Of course, there's been a lot of speculation about Kim's health, uh, speculation that he wasn't doing so well after a medical procedure, uh, and, and, and speculation that he, he might be in, in very, very poor or, or very serious condition. But now, according to Yonhap, um, state-run media, uh, Kim Jong-un has made an appearance at a factory in the country um, we're going to continue to follow these headlines uh, as we as we as the, as we get them they are rolling in right now um, and uh, bring you more as we have it we'll be right back with more of bloomberg we're going to be talking about apple coming up this is bloomberg For the first time in more than a decade, Apple didn't provide a forecast for the quarter or the year, sparking concern that the iPhone maker's performance will suffer later this year. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Alistair Barr, who's been taking a closer look at this. Alistair, of course, uh, we spoke with Tim Cook yesterday. He talked about a very depressed March, but said that things were already picking up in April. You could see investors trying to digest his comments in the stock after hours going from positive to negative. As Apple reported its results, shares ending today down a little over one and a half percent. What are the concerns? 
I think the main thing is uncertainty, especially for the current quarter we're in. Um, actually, probably the comments he made to you on that interview are probably the best best thing we've got so far to know what's happening. Um, so, so you know, the, the late March and early April, he, he describes it as very depressed um, in the midst in the midst of the crisis. I imagine not very many people were buying expensive iPhones at that point. Um, and then he said it, it picked up in the second half of April, but um, you know that was from a very depressed level. And going forward, the the CFO did um, you know mention that um, iPhone sales and wearable sales, um, AirPods and things like that, um, that they are are going to be you know they're going to perform year over year um, you know e- even worse than the first quarter in in the second quarter. So really, it really now it now it's basically you know there's this huge recession that's going on. Um, so you really don't know how well um, Apple is going to do sales-wise. You know, he did talk about the lack of visibility, the lack of certainty, uh, you know, to explain why Apple wasn't providing a forecast. And I did ask him, you know, how do you think $1,000-plus phones are going to perform in this economy? And he was optimistic, and, and especially optimistic because of the stimulus from the federal government. But I wonder what the reality is when you've got, you know, 20-some million people unemployed and no end in sight to this recession. I think there's a a few things to consider. There was a new cheap iPhone, the SE, that they did release, which seems, I wouldn't say perfect for the pandemic because it's still $400 or more, Um, but it's, you know, a better offering from, from Apple right now. Um, and it even has a, you know, it even doesn't use Face ID, so you could open it with uh, with a mask on. Um, but uh, I, I think also on the positive side of the ledger, um, Apple and even some other tech companies, but especially Apple, has become pretty. If you already have an iPhone, it's become almost okay. an essential service, I would say. So um, that 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 should help. Them. Right. Definitely an interesting way to look at it. Okay, Alistair Barr, thanks so much for your insight coming up. We're going to be talking about Tesla and another tweet storm by CEO Elon Musk, which cost Tesla a big chunk of chains. Also, we're going to toss to the CEO of TaskRabbit, Stacey brown Philpot. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Tesla shares plunging today down by as much as 13% this after what else but a tweet from Elon Musk, who tweeted that even he believes Tesla's share price is too high. I want to bring in our Bloomberg News reporter, Dana Hull, who covers Tesla and has covered Elon's tweets now for the last several years. Dana, why would Elon Musk uh, tweet that his own shares are priced too high? Yes, this was quite the news cycle today. I mean, he has said that he believes Tesla is overvalued in the past. Why he's doing it now when he just sort of had a great quarter is anybody's guess. Uh, You know, the backdrop of this is that he's very frustrated with the fact that Tesla's Fremont factory remains closed. So, you know, I sort of personally wonder if this is a way to pressure Governor Gavin Newsom um, but yeah, it sent the stock down quite a bit today, and you know, a lot of some people were asking me if Elon had been hacked. No, he was not. This, this has been to Elon. Meantime, he's been really vocal about uh, the stay-at-home order because, of course, Tesla's factory remains shut down in Fremont, California, and he has been very upset that workers can't go in and work on building their cars. But there's been some backlash to that. You know, Musk calling this fascist, that this is not uh, democratic at all. But then there were a wave of, uh, of tweets and responses today, including from Ariana Grande's mom, who said now she'd have to sell her Tesla, hashtag boycott Tesla. What do you make of the response here? Yeah, well, what's really interesting is that, I mean, 10,000 workers work at that factory, and so it is a it is a big employer uh, in in the Bay Area. And you know, Tesla has had a long and fairly um, you know copacetic relationship with the state of California 
keep in mind Elon Musk is looking to build a second gigafactory in the U.S. It's not going to be in California. He's basically said that it could be in Texas. It's clearly probably going to be in a red state. And so while he's sort of expressing his enormous frustration with the fact that he's not able to operate in Fremont, you know, keep in mind that uh, behind the scenes, Tesla is negotiating some kind of deal for a factory package in a, another state. And so it's just been really interesting politically to sort of mm. think about all of these machinations happening while he's tweeting things like, you know, give Americans back their freedom. I mean, part of his tweets today were the Star Spangled Banner. So he's kind of appealing to this libertarian Trump crowd in a lot of ways um, while, while protests are happening around the country about the stay-at-home orders. Uh, but I think it's, you know, it's strategic in some ways. I mean, he's looking to wrangle a really good deal out of whatever state is going to land this gigafactory. And he's also trying to pressure well, and California to let the factory open. And, you know, you've got even Tesla owner, even he might be playing to one crowd, but, it, it, you know, there are Tesla owners who are calling him incredibly irresponsible for not thinking about the public health risk. I mean, what what's the other state that could be the beneficiary of this? Well, states like Texas, which have already basically sort of signaled that they're reopening their economies and, uh, you know, and, and right to work states and, you know, states, states that are that have been very quick to reopen California. You know, the Bay Area was, was the first region of the country to close down because of coronavirus. And it's going to be very careful on how it reopens. But the other thing that's interesting is that, you know, a lot of longtime shareholders, I mean, they got burned today. You know, tweet, his tweet about the stock sent the shares down a significant amount. And, you know, there's been so much in the past about Elon Musk trying to burn the shorts. Today, he burned the longs. He, he burned his, his longtime investors, and he burned his own employees because employees have a lot of their compensation tied up into the company's stocks as well. So, you know, sometimes I mean, there's also speculation that Elon did this to kind of prove to people that he doesn't care about money, that, that he really just sort of cares about getting back to work. But when he does things that impact stock, it impacts a lot more than just him. And, um, right. and so and let's, everyone let's not forget Ariana Grande's mom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's not forget Ariana Grande's mom, too, who now says she has to get rid of her Tesla. All right. Of course, um, we'll continue to follow uh, that. Dana Hull, uh, who covers Tesla for Bloomberg, thank you so much. Meantime, Congress wants answers from Jeff Bezos, why some of his past statements may be coming back to haunt him. That's next. This is Bloomberg. A House Antitrust Committee is calling on Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos to testify the concerns about how Amazon has treated third-party sellers. I want to bring in our Bloomberg News reporter from D.C., Ben Brody, who's been following this story. And, Ben, it's actually uh, statements that were made by uh, Amazon's general counsel that might be coming back to haunt Amazon and get Jeff Bezos in the hot seat. Tell us what the latest is here. Right. So the House Judiciary Committee uh, sent a letter to Bezos after the reports that we've been seeing all week that Amazon systematically collected this data on its third party merchants to improve its own products and improve its own sales. Uh, the problem is that an Amazon lawyer last year in July testified that they don't do that uh, basically at all. Uh, and the Judiciary Committee is saying, look, you have to come in and you have to clarify this. And if you don't, uh, we have the capability to subpoena you. Uh, and they said that we're basically willing to. And they said, look, uh, you know, this could have been perjury. You know, we've seen uh, big tech execs testifying in Washington over the last few years, including Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai, uh, Jack Dorsey from Twitter. I mean, do we think that Jeff Bezos could actually find himself uh, in the hot seat? I think it's entirely possible. I think that the uh, committee is willing to issue a subpoena if they really feel that they have to. I, I think you're absolutely right. Bezos is the big fish who hasn't gone in here. He's the last remaining target. Uh, this particular antitrust investigation into big tech has really zeroed in on Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple. And Bezos is the one who has engaged least. Uh, he clearly doesn't want to, but the committee is saying, look, we're not going to issue our final report. We're going to keep this investigation going unless you come in. So there is somewhat of a standstill. 
Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the progress on these antitrust investigations. Obviously, we've been in the middle of a pandemic. I asked Alphabet CFO Ruth Pora, uh, you know, it, what the status was if the investigations were on hold, and she said they're continuing to respond. But do you know how aggressively these um, investigations have been able to move forward, if at all, given um, the fact that so much of the country is shut down? I, I think a lot of this will depend on what Congress is able to do as a whole when it comes back in. How many staffers can come in? Uh, how many members can be together on a dais at the same time? Uh, I think a lot of those questions are lingering. Uh, as far as I'm aware from my reporting, document production uh, was still uh, continuing at the time that the lockdown uh, came down. It had kind of trickled off. The majority of it had happened in the fall, uh, but it is still ongoing. Uh, the committee had said that it wanted to issue its final report with legal recommendations at the end of March. Uh, the pandemic, if not uh, the actual legislative work, clearly has scuttled that. And now they're putting that off and saying, you know, this isn't going until Bezos comes in. All right. Ben Brody for us in Washington. Ben, thanks so much for joining us. Now, speaking of Amazon, essential workers from Amazon, Instacart, Walmart, grocery, retail, and delivery companies are striking across the country today on May Day, protesting various labor issues, including safety concerns, pay, and benefits. They want better protection. Uh, I talked about all that and more with TaskRabbit CEO Stacey Brown Philpot. Take a listen. While we're not aware of any taskers who are involved in these strikes, what I think this is doing is highlighting the importance of gig economy workers at this time. I mean, this pandemic has really brought to the forefront how essential these workers are. So my thinking is that our taskers and a lot of people who are going out and doing things for people and providing those essential needs are really the heroes and should be asking for their rights and their benefits. Our taskers can set their own hourly rates. They determine when and how they want to work. And we have a platform that gives them the freedom and the flexibility to do so. And I encourage our taskers to really ask for what they need. We are doing all the things to help keep them safe, providing the safety kits, giving them hand sanitizers, gloves, and masks, and providing them with ways to do all of their tasks in a contactless way. And I encourage all of our community to participate in supporting people who are on the front lines in that way. Now, you use the word heroes, and it's interesting because we were speaking with an Instacart worker who was protesting, and she said she didn't like being called a hero. She said, we're doing this because we're desperate, because we need the money. And a lot of the people who do these jobs, you know, they're out of work, uh, and especially at a time when the economy is going into recession, they're the ones that are going to be most hurt. I mean, do you think what the government is doing enough is enough? Do you think uh, the federal government can do more? And can companies like TaskRabbit and others do more? to make sure that pay and, and benefits are there? Well, not everybody is impacted by this pandemic equally. You're right. Many of our taskers who choose to continue to task right now are doing it because they need to make money. They depend on our platform to make a meaningful income. And so, yes, they're going out, but they're going out and they're doing this because they need to earn an income. They need to make money. The CARES Act, is an opportunity it is an option that the government has provided and we know anecdotally some of our taskers are taking advantage of that we are putting in preventative measures we are helping our taskers do tasks in a virtual way so a lot of furniture assembly tasks are now happening virtually because we can't go into people's homes so we're doing our part to adapt the way that our business model works and the way that tasks can happen so that people can be safe. I think it takes a community to do this. It's not just government, it's not just business. On that note, there's also this other contingent of, of workers that's protesting the stay-at-home orders. They want to go back to work. And you're on Gavin Newsom's task force. Of course, the shelter in place in California was just extended to May 31st. There's a lot of grumbling about it from, let's say, Elon Musk. He called it an outrage. What's your reaction to some of the criticism that this is too blunt force and, and perhaps uh, there should have been more of a, a phased reopening or that companies and, and, and factories should be given a choice? Well, I'm honored to be on this task force. It's a collection of government, business, healthcare, you know, academics together. And we're all trying to make the best decision. It is a phased approach. There are four phases. And one of the big areas of focus is focusing on the communities that are hardest hit. 
So a big piece of entering into the next phase is how do we make sure we have childcare for all of the parents who want to go back to work? So saying it's simply easy to just open up the doors and go back to work, there's a lot of infrastructure and solutions that have to be addressed. How do we make sure we have testing available for anybody who wants to get tested and those tests are accurate? Those are all the questions that this task force has been designed to create. So it's not that no one wants to go back to work. We just want to make sure we do it in the right way. My role is to make sure all of the independent contractors who also want to continue to town can do that when, when the state does reopen in a safe way. So let's talk about that. You've, you've said that your growth and activity has slowed, but that people are still working and they are doing tasks, grocery delivery. You mentioned putting together furniture. How much activity are you seeing and what kind of activity are you seeing on the platform? We've seen an increase in growth in, in deliveries, all kinds, grocery shopping, picking up medication, dropping off things for healthcare workers who are on the front lines. We've also seen an increase in putting things together, trampolines, barbecue grills, exercise equipment, desks <laughs> for those of us who've never worked from home before but are working from home now. So all of those things are continuing to grow for us and it's just a shift in those categories. We stabilize and as we enter a new normal, we're thinking about what kinds of activities people are gonna wanna do through TaskRabbit in the future and we'll be investing in some of those areas as well. You led the acquisition of TaskRabbit by IKEA, and I'm curious how that relationship is going right now and what the pandemic means for IKEA, which is, you know, obviously people need desks, but people aren't shopping in IKEA, which is such an important part of the IKEA experience. Absolutely. Well, IKEA has been a great partner with us. Our business is stabilized and we have a healthy amount. We had a healthy amount of growth coming into this pandemic which has helped us sort of stabilize where we are today. As IKEA stores have closed, they've kept their online business open. And while they're working through, when do we return to stores? They've used a lot of their time and their 166,000 workers to help across the country, communities thrive. So I just saw a note yesterday that in Costa Mesa, California, they opened up the IKEA parking lot to provide food for families. And that became the food bank for the day for those families. And that was a huge donation and a huge contribution to those communities. So we're really happy to have them as a partner. We're, we're not thriving in the way we want right now, but we're doing our part to help through this pandemic so that when we reopen, we hope our customers will come back, enjoy shopping in an IKEA store, and then using TaskRabbit to get all of their things assembled. Our conversation there with TaskRabbit CEO Stacy Brown Philpot. Well, if there's one industry that may be coronavirus proof, that could be gaming. Our exclusive interview with EA CEO Andrew Wilson is next. This is Bloomberg. In this time of social distancing, people are hungry for even more forms of entertainment, and that includes gaming. That puts bigger pressure on companies like Electronic Arts to continue to churn out content, even though people are sheltering in place around the world. We sat down with Electronic Arts CEO Andrew Wilson to talk about how he's managing 6,000 game developers remotely. Take a listen. We went almost fully work from home, essentially fully work from home mid-March. We started a rolling work from home program from January. As you, as you know, that we have facilities in China and Korea that were kind of early impact zones of, of COVID-19. By mid-March, we had 9,500 employees working from home. Uh, and I would say because we really started to ramp early, our IT and our tech teams uh, and our security teams have done a lot of work in the background. And within two or three days, we were almost fully operational as an organization. Now we have about 6,500 employees building games and creating content and delivering entertainment to fans across the globe. And I would tell you, I've been unbelievably inspired by what our teams have been able to do and how they've been able to support our playing community at this time. And it, to the extent that there have been missing uh, elements in the, in the real world of sport, our teams have come together in partnership with our, with our league partners, whether it's the NFL or FIFA or La Liga or the Premier League or the NHL or soon the UFC 
uh, to deliver new and interesting interactive content to fill those voids. So we feel very good about our ability to support our player base. The NCAA just took a big step towards letting players use their name, image, likeness, and to be paid for those, but not on video games. You did, of course, used to have uh, NCAA football. That was very popular. Are you disappointed that the rule change didn't include video games? You know, would you like to bring that game back? Uh, I, I tell you, I get emails every day and every week and every month from fans of our college football games who beg us to bring them back uh, and, you know, offer me all kinds of hugs and, you know, good, goodness if I, can, if I can bring NCAA uh, football back for them. Um, I would tell you, I think this is a great step. I, I believe it's a first step. We continue to work with the leaders of schools uh, and of athletes of NCAA and others in and around the field. Again, our, our role in this is to deliver great interactive entertainment to the extent that we're allowed to. And our hope is that over time we can do that again, but you know, we're just not sure when that will be. Interesting, okay. Um, so I know people are playing more games, but we're also going into a massive economic downturn. People are losing their jobs. Do you think that that's gonna hurt your bottom line and that people aren't gonna be willing to pay to play, essentially? Well, well, listen, I think that as an industry and as a company, we have great concern for you know, all of our communities and, and any macroeconomic challenges they may face over time. And we will look to help them in any way that we possibly can through that process. What I would say though, is what we have seen in the past is that our form of entertainment is tremendous value. Uh, you know, the cost of a video game is not high in comparison to many things in our lives. When you take free to play games like Apex Legends, or our mobile games, or even our $4.99 a month subscription as part of EA Access that gets you access to our full catalog of games. Our hope is that even as we move through this and we try and work to ensure our communities prosper and don't you know, face the challenges that you know, some people are predicting, that we're able to provide them tremendous value entertainment uh, and fulfill that need they have as, as human beings. Now, the biggest games uh, right now seem to be Fortnite and Call of Duty. What's your sort of answer to that in sort of, you know, a comparable battlefield? Uh, I, I might challenge the biggest games seem to be Fortnite and Call of Duty. I, I, I would agree with you that they're certainly big. Uh, I would also highlight FIFA, uh, which is, you know, one of the greatest entertainment properties on the planet in the context of our interactive games. Madden, who has just had its best year uh, in, in the franchise history, and Apex Legends, who has you know, 80 million players live to date, not to mention The Sims, which right now has been a tremendous game for communities where people are coming together and having virtual weddings and virtual birthday parties, and we're able to entertain a whole different demographic of players. So we feel very good about the breadth and depth of our portfolio and how we've been able to use that portfolio through this time to entertain players and, and fill some of the gaps that have been formed as a result of the coronavirus. Epic Games just teamed up with the rapper Travis Scott for uh, an in-game concert on Fortnite. Will we be seeing you doing in-game events? Uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of great stuff for our communities. Uh, again, our Stay Home Play Together campaign has had over a dozen activations uh, across celebrities and athletes uh, and, and TV folks who have come in and played with fans and participated in tournaments as part of fans. And you, you know, we've got another hundred or so of those activations in place and we'll continue to work on those to entertain fans at this challenging time. Now, talk to us then about your resources to bring new content to market with all of the studios around the world at home right now. You know, what does that mean for the pipeline and you know, when, when we will see, start seeing some new content? I mean, you're seeing new content almost weekly right now as we continue to provide content, both paid and free for the community through this, through this challenging time. Um, and as I said, we've been essentially work from home since mid-March. And one of the things that comes from the investment we've made over the last you know, five or six years around our digital platform, single engine, single IT structure, is that we've been able to rally an organization and bring them together to continue to deliver amazing content for our fans. Um, I, you know, I think it's too early to tell whether there's any meaningful long-term impact to our, to our pipeline, 
But right now we feel very good about how operational we are as a company and how we've been able to support fans with new content and new entertainment through this period. Electronic Arts CEO Andrew Wilson there. And some more Friday tweet action from Tesla CEO Elon Musk. As we told you earlier, uh, he tweeted that he believed Tesla shares were overvalued. Uh, he's been getting a lot of uh, flack for that, especially from Tesla investors. A uh, user on Twitter saying, can you please just state your account was hacked or killing every investor that invested in you and Tesla right now? Musk just responded to that tweet saying, as always, I am optimistic about Tesla in the long term. We'll be watching this through the weekend and bring you any developments on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Stay tuned. This is Bloomberg.